I'm Andrew Smith, and today I want you to look at the world a little differently through the eyes of a child. Now, whilst this might look like a, a Victorian picture, this is actually from me at the start of school. And I was a very curious child, always asking questions. And whilst it might look like I was the teacher's pet, there I am, back row, butter wouldn't melt. I was quite the opposite, I think. I was a bit of a pain. I wouldn't take no for an answer. And I was always asking questions. As I went through school, I felt like I'd kind of been fibbed to as we went through the years. Maths was a particular example of this. Just when you'd nailed the gradient of a line, someone would come along and say, actually, there's a third dimension you've got to worry about. It was all very, very unfair. And as I went through to university, I realized that there was no such thing as having complete knowledge of something. All I could really do was keep asking questions. Now, as children, I think it's very easy to cultivate that curiosity, but sometimes as we become adults, we lose that slightly. And today, I want to ask why, and I also want to whisk up some curiosity of your own. So let's talk about curiosity. Uh, curiosity is an essential part of any creative process, but it's not just a passive act of open-mindedness. You've got to grasp it. You've got to actively engage with it. Asking questions leads you to discover new things. And for me, that curiosity led me into my day job, which is as an aerospace engineer. Now, it's literally part of my job description to ask difficult questions. Questions like, what might the aircraft fuels of the future look like? How might that change the shape of aircraft? And, you know, what's the correct etiquette for reclining your seat on a flight? We still don't know on that one. We're still researching. But in those early years of my job, I faced a slightly more unusual career-based question. What comes next? And I don't know how many of you relate to this, but I felt like I'd been on a bit of a treadmill of milestones. So I had to get through school, don't fail your exams, check. Get into university, tick that off. Again, don't fail, tick. Get a good job or a, a, a job that was okay, check. Don't fail that, get on the graduate scheme, check. And then the milestones vanish. It's all over to you. You've got to choose your own direction. And I find that quite alarming <laughs> at the time. Now, a lot of other people, when they have a career crisis, they might talk to a mentor. I applied to go on to a national TV show, uh, which was the Great British Bake Off, uh, in 2016. And it was an incredible experience, a slightly non-logical choice for career progression. But the course of career progression did never run smooth. But I had an amazing experience. It was intense. It was amazing for learning but it had some quite interesting unintended consequences. I started getting some invites to do things I'd never thought would be possible for me, including the tantalizing offer to bake live on daytime television with Lorraine, lovely Lorraine. Who could say no to that? So whilst I was expertly demonstrating on my first appearance on live TV, lots of things going on. You've got people talking in your ears. Uh, you've got some producer kind of flailing in the background. I was expertly demonstrating how to cut a butternut squash. And unfortunately, I had a little bit of a knife slippage, which made it look like I chopped a finger off, which flew off to the side on camera. And um, a very kind media outlet described it as a bloodbath, which I thought was a little uncharitable. <laughs> but it taught me that you know, no matter what age you are, no matter what you're doing, try new things. Failure is always going to be a part of that process. Amazingly, they had me back. I then got a mysterious invite in 2016 to bake a cake for work. And this again got me thinking, well, there's these two worlds, of baking and engineering, that I kind of inhabit. What might come next? Because I'd spent all my career to that point working in engineering. It's everything I'd poured my life and soul into. But some of these other opportunities felt like they were really time limited. How could I say no? I'd applied for the show to give me some direction, but now I was being pulled confusingly in two different ones, how to proceed. So this mysterious call, it was to make an engineering-themed cake for a special visitor at Rolls-Royce. Now, oh, I like the ooh there. That was nice. That was gratifying. So I decided I can't just make an ordinary cake. It's got to have some actual engineering in it. So this was my jet engine cake. And it was the first time I'd really deployed my engineering skills on a cake project. It had gingerbread fan blades. I had to learn how to cast caramel. Uh, and I also had to worry about fan tip clearances on the cake or on the outside. There was real engineering in this cake, and it fundamentally changed my perspective of that interaction between those two disciplines. 
Also, if they'd have told me it was for Prince William, I probably would have said no, but that was an amazing experience, and I'm glad they only told me at the last minute, otherwise their answer might have been very, very different. And this fundamental change of perception started to spiral, and I started seeing these engineering connections in other aspects of baking, and I started to play around with this. In the middle there, you can see a geode cake I made, and uh, this was formed using supersaturated sugar solution, and that's the exact same mechanism by how real geodes form with a supersaturated mineral solution. So you could use these same mechanisms. The same goes for that caramel bar you can see on the right-hand side. When a caramel bar wasn't performing as I structurally needed it to in a bake, I thought, well, what would an engineer do? Well, concrete's brittle, just like caramel. Let's reinforce it, get some strawberry laces on there. And it turns out, when you break a caramel bar reinforced with strawberry laces, they neck and narrow in the exact same way as steel fails in reinforced concrete. Not so crazy, hey? So these two worlds, I felt like I was being pulled in two different directions before, started to merge together a little bit more. I call it baconeering. I'm still trying to get it into the dictionary. It's going to be a very long time, but that is what I do now. I do baconeering. And if you want to join me on a little journey into orbit, nothing illustrates baconeering better than a practical example. So you're going to see a table appear behind me that's going to go over here. But I want you to come with me on a journey into orbit. Now, if you ask any astronaut what the most stressful and invigorating part of any journey to space is, they will say it's re-entry. And just like putting your hand out of the window of a car and feeling the air resistance, we slam back into the atmosphere in order to slow down. Now, this is a really intense process. It generates uh, forces on the body of between 5 and 6 G, and uh, NASA astronaut Doug Wheelock described it like going over Niagara Falls in a barrel, but the barrel's on fire. So that kind of tells you how exciting it is. And he's not wrong. You know, those, this rendering that you can see here, inside that plasma layer, you've got temperatures of about 1400 degrees C. And that also happens to be very similar to the temperature inside a butane blowtorch. This is the baconeering bit. And it turns out, uh, we're going to bring a camera on so you can see this a little bit closely, that uh, a retro dessert has a lot of insight to offer as to how we safely return astronauts from orbit. Who would have thought it? And it all starts with a sponge base, a firm sponge base that's got to protect some very special cargo. Now, in this case, it's not astronauts. It's something far more valuable, a massive dome of ice cream. And yet, if you guessed it, that's right, we're making a baked Alaska, and hopefully, if my elaborate winch mechanism has worked, you will see the dome of ice cream on top. Never work with children, pets, or food on stage. That's what they said, but here we are. Now, obviously, we've got the atmosphere around us that's going to heat that up, so I need to give it a protective blanket, and that's where the meringue comes in. Now, this is a Swiss meringue, um, slightly more stable than its French counterpart. <laughs> I didn't say that. But um, you make it with a <laughs> behave. You make it with a sugar syrup, and you heat it, which means that uh, the egg whites become a lot more stable, so uh, it can deal with humidity. And I'm just going to drop this very voluptuously on top here. And the amazing thing about meringue is, uh, when you whisk it for a very long time, you incorporate loads of microscopic air bubbles. And as I'm pushing this over, what I'm doing is those air bubbles make an incredible insulation layer. And you might think, air, is that a great insulator? Because in an open room like this, convection means the air is just flowing around all the time. But if you were to divide this room into lots of pockets, and the pockets are the key, they're incredible insulators. It's the reason why we have uh, lots, of, uh, lots of fibers in our house insulation. It's the reason why we have a gap in our window panes uh, in order to have double glazing. And it's also why, if you want to try something at home, if you make meringue and put it in the freezer, if you taste it from the freezer, it will not taste freezing cold. It might even taste a little bit warm, and that's because humans are really good at perceiving heat transfer, but not temperature. So if something's insulated, it feels like it's warmer. That's why when you uh, wander to the bathroom late at night, when you go from the carpet to the tiles, they might be the exact same temperature, but you will feel the chill when you go onto the tile. Now, I've given that a little ruffle there just to make Mary Berry proud. But um, <laughs> when I bring in my blowtorch, now, the analogy here is the center of this blowtorch is very similar to what the entire base of the space shuttle might have to deal with for five or six minutes all over and you're going to start getting some marshmallowy wafts in the front row here, so enjoy those when they come in your direction. 
but this is protecting the ice cream on the inside. And you might be thinking, gosh, you know, egg whites, has that really got much to do with engineering? <sighs> Stayed solid. You might be thinking, egg whites, what have those got to do with engineering? Well, engineers luckily have a little bit more to work with. And that's what this tile is. And I'm going to go back to the slides before I blowtorch this. But if you uh, look at this picture, this isn't a space shuttle. This is uh, the Russian Buran. And the Buran was kind of like the space shuttle, but a copy, essentially. It looks very similar. It's like if I copied your homework. Um, and if you look at those black tiles on the bottom, those are the thermal insulation tiles. And I've got a real one of those over here. And we'll briefly um, show you the camera on this again. This is an incredible material. And if I zoom in on this under the microscope, you would see this was also inside made of lots of microscopic air pockets. But instead of egg white, we can be a little bit more clever, and we use silicon oxide. And I could blowtorch that entire tile for 10, 15 minutes. It would be cool to the touch underneath in something that's only a few inches thick. So that's the majesty of the Buran. I've showed you a baked Alaska. You might be like, Andrew, come on. These are chalk and cheese. What's going on here? Well, as an engineer, I like data. And uh, coming back to show you some of that data, I found a paper online. And this was a paper from Tokyo Yasai University. And uh, thankfully, they've done the research, so I don't have to. They did a paper called Thermal Conduction in Egg Albumin Foam. That's meringue to you and I. And they've done the maths on this. So they gave me all the data I needed to give you, for the first time, a definitive comparison between state-of-the-art Buran engineering and the humble meringue that you have at home. And they are more similar than you might think. The densities and the volume by air are very, very similar, but it's the conductivity that's really, really interesting. And what this means, those figures, if I was to take the Buran tile and replace it with meringue, I would only need three times the thickness of meringue, <laughs> only three times, to have the same insulation properties. Now, you might be thinking, well, there's a clear problem here. It's got sugar, so it's really flammable. Yes, but the insulation properties are really, really similar. So if I was going up to orbit, I would definitely be taking some egg whites with me. Now, jokes aside, there's a serious point to be made here about multidisciplinary thinking in engineering. And two quick examples. Xanthan gum, which if any of you are gluten-free will have used before, it was a food additive designed in the 1960s. It's an incredible thickening agent. Now they can also use that exact same chemical to help set concrete underwater in structural engineering because it can thicken it so it doesn't wash out under the water. Literally the exact same chemical. Another example, candy floss. The original patents for that came out in the early 20th century. There's now an amazing company that is taking plastic waste and weaving that, melting that into thin strands to make insulation for refugee camps, inspired by one process and tackling a different problem. And I'm a huge believer in this multidisciplinary thinking. Following that line of curiosity for me led to some opportunities on the other side of the camera too. We called it Baking Impossible. And uh, some of you may have seen this. It went out on Netflix at the end of 2021. I was lucky enough to be a producer and challenge designer on the series, as well as judging, which is a lot more fun than being a contestant, let me tell you. And these contestants did amazing things. We put together teams of bakers and engineers to solve baconeering problems, and they broke boundaries. They discovered new edible glues that they held the recipe secret to. They made gingerbread skyscrapers that not only had to look and taste great, but had to survive an earthquake-shaking table with an edible form of shock absorption. They discovered marshmallow, bam marshmallow bumpers for crash test vehicles. They made edible boats. It was a real ride. And the main thing for me was it showed the fun and creative side of engineering. Those questions that I had when I was a child, that curiosity, this indulged that in a fun format. And in engineering, we've got a skill shortage coming up, so we need to inspire the next generation, and this is a way to convert that. So, what are you going to take away? You might not like baking, you might not like engineering, hopefully you do a little bit more after this. But you will have your own silos in your own life, which you think are completely separate. And just because somebody else hasn't done it before doesn't mean you can't follow that. That bit in the middle of your interest, that intersection, that's the curious bit. That's where innovation happens. That's where the fun happens. That's where you can inspire other people. And following that for me has taught me the value of that childlike curiosity. 
So whether you're a builder who has a passion for trigonometry or a ballet dancer who likes a bit of particle physics, or in my case, just a humble engineer who likes a bit of baking, I truly believe there is a way you can have your cake and eat it. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Thank you. I should have uh, brought you a spoon, Herb. That's terrible manners. I've only got one spoon on stage. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I, I, want, I wanted to ask um, uh, about, um, because obviously the engineering side of, of what you have been doing, uh, did you grow up in this country? Uh, grew up in Belfast. Belfast, yes. okay, yeah. So, um, you know, this would be something that obviously, you know, your teachers and schools and, and, and even the prime minister would be saying, oh, good, good, good on you, thank you, we need more STEM engineering type people. And probably less so, I would imagine, on the baking side. Uh, and, <laughs> and I'm just wondering, you know, uh, to some extent, like, you know, uh, you, you know, why you stuck with it, if you will, and then why did you decide, what was the time you thought, oh, we should bring these two things together? I think th the first time was definitely doing the cake for Prince William, and that got a lot of press coverage at the time, which right. was a bit of a game changer for me. And I realized no one else was really doing that yeah. in this space. A lot of people were doing science of cooking yeah. uh, and how you look at the stuff in your kitchen. But sure. for me, it just started off as fun. And then if I find it interesting, I figured, well, I might find an audience that also finds that kind of curiosity inspiring. Mm -hmm. So it's just a, it's a fun routine. Um, I'm not wedded, you know, my day job in engineering. I don't do baked versions of jet engines in the <laughs> office. Sometimes my colleagues get to try things, yeah. but uh, the baking doesn't necessarily bleed into the engineering okay. as much. Okay, cool. And is it something that you're planning to continue to pursue as a, as a side interest? Uh, yes, hopefully. Yeah. So we're hoping to get a second series of Baking Impossible, and we're also looking at potentially doing some kind of more kid series over here where they can submit ideas, because we got a, a deluge of ideas off the back of the series for chocolate roller coasters, marshmallow forts, all that kind of thing. So I have a really tasty, um, <laughs> kind of ideas document to work through. Um, some delicious discoveries to be made, I'm sure. <laughs> Andrew, thank you so much. Thank Great you very much. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you, everybody.